church. How are we doing this morning? I want to start us off with prayer this morning, um, just to reorient our minds around Jesus. Um, I know a lot of times we can go through our weeks um, and forget his presence. He's with us um, everywhere we go. He's with us when we're uh, doing the dishes. He's with us when we're at work. Um, and sometimes we can easily forget that. And so this morning, I just want to pray and invite God to encounter us this morning. So would you pray with me? Um, Jesus, we just take a moment. We rest. And we remember that you are here. We turn our eyes, we turn our hearts towards you, Jesus. We thank you that you have brought us all together as one body to lift up the name of Jesus. And I ask that um, you would free us from any distraction, any baggage that we carried in here. I pray that you would protect our minds and our hearts to be completely focused on you this morning. That, that this wouldn't be a service about me, that it wouldn't be a service about any of us, God, that it would be all about you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We worship you this morning and know that you are good. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning as we worship.
There is truly nothing better than him. Can we just sing that again? Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you, Jesus. Sing it again. Oh, there's nothing better than
name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, the name at which victory is won, the name at which battles are fought and won, God. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. I pray this morning that if there's anyone in here that needs freedom, needs deliverance from the stronghold in their heart, that you would help them to recognize the power of the name of Jesus in their situation, that there is hope, there is peace, there is joy, all in the name of Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you for meeting us here. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, Brookside. How are we doing today? Awesome. Have a seat. Welcome. My name is Steve. I'm the Next Gen Pastor. If you're new, welcome. We are excited to have you here. We are excited that you are joining us this morning. If you don't know what Brookside is about, turn your attention to that big lit up bunch of words over there that says Jesus centered everything. That's what we are about here. Most of us spend our lives, I know myself included, where we stand at the center of everything that we are and we orient everything around us. And we are here at Brookside are on a journey together to discover what that would mean to pull us out of that circle and put Jesus squarely in that circle and focus everything we are, everything we have, and everything we do on him in hopes that we would create better, more healthy relationships, and saturate our community with the gospel and the love of Jesus. Amen? All right. So I got a couple of things that we need to talk about this morning real quick. The first and probably most important announcement is if you see Pastor Yule, I want you to compliment his shoes because he copied mine. He saw my shoes and he said, I like your shoes. Literally three days later, he says, I bought the shoes. So compliment his choice of footwear. Um, next week, February 20th, is our annual business meeting. It's at 1030. That's between the services. So come, enjoy service, stick around, and then we'll do the meeting afterward. A little bit of celebration, a little bit of information. It's going to be awesome. Make sure you are here for that. Baptisms. March 27th, if you are interested, there's a QR code right there. I'll give you a second, and you can scan that right from where you're sitting and make sure that you get all the information and get registered for that. Um, exciting stuff that we've got coming up. Um, most of the reason that I'm up here is because we have a lot of things going on in our Next Gen Ministries department. There's all kinds of crazy things going on, and I wanted to bring you up to speed on a couple of things because there's a lot of questions that come out, and I don't get really much of a chance to talk to you guys as a whole. So if you have kids of any age, now's your time to dial in. Here we go. Daddy-daughter date night is coming up. There is a table out by the kids' hallway that my wife is sitting at, ready to say hi to you, ready to get you guys signed up. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be a party. It's going to be just a fabulous event. We're going to have food. We're going to have music. We're going to have crafts. We're going to have all kinds of things. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how old your daughter is. Come, enjoy, hang out. It's going to be a great time of, of hanging out as a family. Child dedications are coming up. If you've signed up recently... I'm going to be contacting you. If you are interested in having your child dedicated, go ahead and sign up. Again, QR code. And I'll be contacting you, probably everybody, this week. But just so you know, we are doing things a little bit differently. We want to make sure that child dedications are not just some kind of ritualistic thing we do up here and we just kind of make sure and did we just say, hey, yeah, it's cool, we got some kids, and you're dedicated, and yay, everyone claps, and it's wonderful, and that's all good. But we want to make this thing stick, and we want to make it mean something even more as a family and as a church family. So I'm going to be contacting you specifically with some details on that. 
a lot of you have been asking questions about summer. And what are we doing for the summer? Are we doing Spring Hill? Are we doing this? Are we doing that? What's going on? We are working on that, and that should be solidified, hopefully, by the end of the week. And we'll be sending out some information on that. So just sit tight. Stay tuned. I know a lot of you are working on summer plans. I am, too. And we want to get our schedules figured out. So just stay tuned. That is coming. We also have some really, really cool announcements in terms of our staffing. Uh, my wife has been just incredibly integral in trying to help make sure that everything is running smoothly in the preschool wing, but we were able to bring on a new staff member, Jessica Ampapong, and she refused to come up here. But she is down there and she is wearing a badge. If you're down there, say hello. She's doing a tremendous job. She is now in charge of a good portion of the kids' ministry stuff, mostly the preschool. Uh, and my wife is stepping over to more of the volunteer side of things. Uh, and we are adding new people to our volunteer staff every week. It's amazing. We've got people down there right now doing uh, uh, observations and learning more about it and, and really just understanding like, where they might want to fit in. If that might be you, we'll always, always happily talk to you. So come see me. Uh, and lastly, if you have an elementary student... Uh, don't forget to grab these devotionals. These are awesome family resources for you guys to uh, get in the Word together, to uh, play games together, to uh, do crafts together sometimes, and grow together as a family. Because this is a... This, this, I can't talk this morning. Let's try that again. This discipleship thing that we do is about the family and making sure that we can do it as a family. Whew! That was a lot. I was trying to do that quick because I tend to talk too much. So that's all my announcements. Everybody got all those? I know that was a lot. But this morning, we have a special guest, uh, Brandon Risch. Some people like to call him Brian, but Brandon is um, a veteran pastor. He's been, he was a pastor longer than I've even been in ministry, but currently serves as the director of church planning. Did I get that right? Uh, at the FEC, so just over across the, the field and the mini pond and up by the road over there. Um, and he's been doing that for just about the last year. We are privileged to have Brandon come bring the word uh, and just to kind of keep continuing uh, what we've been talking about, uh, about what it means to be Jesus-centered. So, Brookside, let's give him a family welcome, Brandon Rich. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And um, it's funny, as the kids were coming in earlier uh, during the service, one of the kids stopped and looked at me and like, who are you? <laughs> and I was like, I'm not Eric. <laughs> I'm not Eric. So uh, it's a joy to be here with you uh, this morning. There's so many people I know in this church body that are just so awesome. And uh, as I look out into the room, I see so many of you, fam familiar faces. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Pastor Eric, your pastor, and I are good friends. We first met in college uh, when I was playing basketball at a small university in Indiana. The second year there, I got rocked by the grace of God. I came to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior of my life. Uh, prayed that I could get into a Christian university. And so I ended up at Indiana Wesleyan University. And in the dorm that I lived in, on the same floor was your pastor. And uh, he would often see me reading my Bible as a new believer in a side room somewhere on that floor. And he would, and I just remember Eric coming in and encouraging me often in, in my new faith. And so uh, Eric, uh, just an awesome friend of mine and just really lived out his faith on campus both he and his girlfriend at the time, Heather, who would eventually become his wife. And so my wife, Candace, and I have a, have a deep love and respect and gratitude for Eric and for Heather. And so uh, he, didn't, he didn't pay me to say this at all, I promise. <laughs> but as he's in Texas um, preparing for the next year's worth of ministry, um, just wanna, want you to let you know that if you didn't know already, you have an awesome couple leading this church family and just show your gratitude to, to them whenever you see them. Just let them know how much you appreciate them, okay? Um, a little bit about myself. I, I grew up in a small town in Indiana, uh, in the town of Pendleton. And usually there's only a few people that know where that is at or have heard of it. And, and anytime that I mention my hometown, um, this is the typical response that I, that I get from people. 
Isn't that where the prison is located? That's what, that's what I, I'm like, forget the fact that uh, my hometown looks like it came out of a Hallmark movie. You want to focus on the prison. That's great. Fantastic. Uh, but for those of us that lived in, live in Pendleton, um, we, we often forget it's even there. It's on the edge of town. You don't often think about it until, you know, the inmates um, break out of the jail and they, they run through your backyard in their orange jumpsuits. You just get used to it. You wave to them. <laughs> You just wave to them and say hello, and then they go on their merry little way. Um, but, but even though I cringe when people mention that, when I, when I mention my hometown, there was a story that, uh, that caught national news a while back that came out of that prison. And it first appeared on, in 2013 on the Katie Couric show. You remember Katie Couric? Well, when she had that show, it, they, they told this story on there. And so I want to share briefly that story to start with, because it's going to lead us into what we're going to talk about today in God's Word. It happened about 30 years ago. There was a young man by the name of Keith Blackburn. He was 18 years old, um, often in trouble. He was a high school dropout. He um, was involved in a lot of acts of crime. And one day he thought, you know, I need a, I need a vehicle because he wanted to do some things that he shouldn't have been doing. And so he walked over to the local Burger King parking lot and he saw a car that he spotted that he, he wanted to steal. And little did he know that there was someone sitting in that car. He thought it was going to be empty. He was going to steal the car, head on his way. Um, but there was sitting in the driver's seat about to get out of her car, another 18 year old named Misty Wallace. Now, Misty, she was just um, months away from graduating high school. She was going to go to college on a softball scholarship, had her whole life in front of her. And so as he sees her and spots her, he, he, it kind of startles him. And in fear of her, and in fear of, of her being a witness to him stealing her car, he ends up pulling out a gun and shooting her point blank in the face. She drops to the ground. She is now in a pool of her own blood. Now, miraculously, by God's grace, she survives the event after several weeks and several surgeries in the hospital. Keith gets arrested and he gets placed in the jail in Pendleton, in the prison in Pendleton. And he is facing a potential 103 year sentence. But he gets out after only eight years and eight months. Now, knowing that information, if you were close to Misty, if you were a close friend of Misty or a close family member, would you be outraged to know that the person who put your loved one in the hospital, suffering, almost dying, gets out after eight years and eight months when it was a potential 103-year sentence. Can you imagine what Misty must have felt when she heard that news as well? I share all that to say, as Pastor Eric has been leading you through this series based on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, I'm sure it's been, been quite obvious and uh, as you've been going through Matthew chapter five through chapter seven, that relationships are just tough. Uh, they are difficult. And, when, um, and, and that can be your marriage relationship, that can be dating relationship, parenting relationship, relationship with, with strangers you don't even know. But when conflict enters the picture, when problems arise within relationships, when human beings collide, we are often taught in our culture to deal with it in one of three ways. We will either avoid people, we will appease people, or we will attack people. We, we avoid people, we think, hey, you know, if there's a problem in this relationship, I'll just pretend like it's not there. Um, I'll, I'll just ignore it. And then as time goes on, maybe it will just be taken care of. You know, time heals all wounds, right? Well, that's not that accurate because time may give the enemy more opportunity to cultivate bitterness and hatred and anger in your heart. We're taught that. We're taught to uh, appease people as well. Let's just tell them what they want to hear if there's a problem in our relationship. And then, um, you know, I'll just dump the problem, move on and act as if nothing happened. But those wounds can still carry on with you. Or we are taught to attack people. Give them a piece of your mind. Tell them what's up. You know, really seek revenge, seek retali retaliation, cancel them. We're in the cancel culture right now, right? Attack people. Our uh, movies are built around revenge and retaliation, isn't it? 
And you imagine like uh, Misty Wallace's story. Uh, that's a perfect setup for a movie. She finds out, let's just play this out. She finds out Keith gets uh, out of prison eight years and eight months later. And so, and so she finds out about now she's gonna, she's gonna have her revenge tour. So, so in the movie, you know, they, they select an actress to play Misty. It's probably Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and the next thing you see, she's doing one-arm push-ups. She's going to the shooting range. She's, she's preparing. She goes to Keith's apartment, kicks wide open the door and says, now you're going to hear from me. You know, it's, there's this movie that is just, you, you can imagine what would take place. This is where culture teaches us to avoid, to appease, or to attack. But what if... What if there's a better way? What if there's a, a much better way? Well, I'm here to tell you there is, and it comes straight from the lips of Jesus. We go back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five, verses 43 through 48. You will get back to the passages we missed. Uh, Pastor Eric had said that you guys were dealing with some, some other passages, and, and, and so he'd given me this passage a while back, and I said, I'm still gonna preach on it, bro. So, um, <laughs> No, uh, it was all good. He, he said that'd be fine. But verse 43 through 48, this is what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, here's what I want you to notice. There, there are two differing values that are expressed in verses 43 and 44. You've got the value of culture, and you've got the value of of Christ. And I love how Jesus sets up this teaching to his audience as they're listening in. Because uh, if you go back to verse 43 through 44, you're going to notice these two values. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Notice those two phrases that are often repeated in chapter five. Jesus will say, you've heard that it was said. All right. Th this is what culture values. But I tell you, and this is what Christ values. You've got two differing values here. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you. Now, Jesus often does this because he's not trying to correct Old Testament. It is true that the Old Testament does say to love your neighbors. That's true. But it never tells you to hate your enemies. So Jesus is not correcting the Old Testament. He's correcting the misinterpretation of the Old Testament because these, this audience that he is speaking to have been used to listening to different rabbis, teachers who are teaching out of the Old Testament and by their traditions, they had, they had twisted what scripture had said. So where did this come from? How did they come to this conclusion? Well, possibly by the fact that when you read the Old Testament and you see that there are, the people that do evil are enemies of God. And that is true. Like, Apart from Jesus Christ, we are enemies of God. The Bible is very clear about that. Apart from a relationship, a, a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ, we are enemies of God. We are under the wrath of God. In Christ, we are out from under the wrath of God. We are adopted into the family of God. We're new creations in Christ. But by reading the Old Testament, maybe they got tripped up on, if you're doing evil here, that you are an enemy of God. And therefore, it would be natural to hate your enemy. But that's not what the Bible says. So Jesus is correcting them. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you. I love this because Jesus is placing his truth over tradition. Someone needs to hear that today. This culture needs to hear this today. I don't care about your opinions and I don't care about what the news has to say because that may not be the truth. The truth is what God's word is and what he declares as truth. Matter of fact, Jesus is the standard of truth. The Bible describes Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. And the reason why he's the truth is because he's the creator. He has always existed. There's never been a time where he has not existed as the second person of the Trinity. 
Uh, Jesus created the, the, the universe and the stars and the mountains and the oceans and the, the plants, the animals, you and me. And because he's the creator, he's the designer. And the designer always gets to be the definer. Now, unless you create this whole thing, then you can define what you designed, but you didn't and I didn't. And he, de he designed it, so therefore he defines it. He defines what truth is. He defines what falsehood is. And so uh, apart from his word, uh, we gotta be real careful about what we take in and discern what is of God and what is not of God. You've heard that it was said, and we're hearing a lot of things today. There's a lot of noise today, but what does God's word have to say? And so Jesus says, but I tell you, he's, here's what tradition says, here's what I tell you. So we have a choice every day. Are we gonna embrace and live out the values of our culture? Are we gonna embrace and live out the values of our creator? And so Jesus says this, he says, to love our enemies. Who are our enemies? Our enemies are those who hate us, those who may despise us, those who may slander your name, those who gossip about you, those who just simply do not like you, your enemies. And he tells us to love our enemies. Now here's what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that you gotta be besties with your enemies, those who hate you. I'm not saying you gotta be BFFs, you gotta be best friends forever. He doesn't, he doesn't say you gotta have these warm, fuzzy feelings towards, towards the person that, that despises you. He's not saying that. If that were the case, none of us could love. <laughs> if that were the case, none of us could truly forgive. And that's hard, that is difficult. What Jesus is saying here is that it's about our attitudes and our actions. Love here in this passage is a verb. It's, it's action, okay? It comes from a transformed heart in Christ. Uh, so in the Bible, uh, when, when the word love appears, there are often four different terms um, explaining what love is, okay? And, and sometimes love is used in the scriptures and the original languages as uh, having to do with the love of friendship. Sometimes it has to do with the love of family. Sometimes it has to do with the romantic love. And then the way that Jesus describes love in this passage it's what's known as, and maybe you've heard this before, agape love. It's a love that is seeking the best for someone else. It's loving someone in such a way that points to um, who our good, gracious, and loving God is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible kind of love. It's, a, it's a kind of love that you'll see throughout the scriptures explained in various ways. 1 Corinthians 13, known as the love chapter. Maybe you've heard of this at weddings. Um, it goes beyond weddings. It should be in our daily lives. But Paul, the apostle Paul, who had been rocked by the grace of God and wrote much of the New Testament as he was a new creation in Christ, led by the Holy Spirit, he wrote down and penned these words in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, um, if I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. He said, he said if, if I give away all my possessions, if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And then in verses four through eight, he describes what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable. And it does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Or as other translations say, love never fails. So you go to these passages of scripture, you're like, what is love? This is what love is. You see it even displayed in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus tells the story of a man getting beaten to a bloody pulp and he left his side of the road to be, to, to, to be dead. And and as he's struggling for his life, there's two religious leaders that just walk right on past him. They see him and they, they're, they're too busy. But love is never in a hurry. And Jesus displays that. And so as he tells the story, the most unlikely candidate that stops and, and helps this man is a Samaritan. The Samaritan goes and he, he bandages up this, this man who's wounded badly. He takes him to this nearest inn. He pays for that man stay and he pays for any extra expenses as well. It's a true picture of love, of sacrificing for the good of the other person. Even in the Old Testament, we see this. Back in Exodus chapter 23, 
where he talks about when you're your enemy and those who hate you, their donkey goes off and goes, goes astray and you notice it, go bring that donkey back to your enemy. Now, I don't know if you have donkeys or not. I don't. But the principle is this. Maybe you do. And that's cool. Let's talk afterwards. But, but the principle is, hey, we, we want to seek the best of someone else. We want to have agape kind of love. We want to have a love that is from God alone. This is an uncommon kind of love. And the reason why it's uncommon is because our world has embraced a certain set of values that are not the values of our creator. That's why it's, this is why it's so hard. It's an uncommon, uncommon kind of love. And so uncommon love requires an uncommon heart. I don't, I don't know what you, I don't naturally like <laughs> wake up in the morning feeling like loving people. I don't know about you. Like I just, I wake up and I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to love those who hate me. I can't wait for those that just totally dislike me. You know, I just, it's hard to even love the people in your own household at times. You don't just naturally wake up. It, uncommon love requires an uncommon heart. And an uncommon heart has to do with a transformed heart that's been transformed by the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. You see, how you interact with people on a daily basis really talks, really um, uh, displays your understanding of God's grace in your life. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, how far has the grace of God impacted your life? How deep does it run in your veins? Because it is going to come out in how you interact with people. Because if, if I realize the good news of Jesus, that I was a sinner in need of a savior, that I was under the wrath of God, and now I'm no longer under the wrath of God, that I deserved hell, but no, long, but no longer am I going that direction because I am in Christ because of what he has done. So when I interact with people who are also made in the image of God, I can love them. I can love them. How deep does the grace of God run in your life? This is what we got to preach the gospel to ourselves every day to be reminded of what the bad news was and then Jesus came and now what the good news is. And so out of my daily interactions with people, it can often reveal just how deep God's grace has run in my life. And so my experience of God's love, my understanding of his grace should lead me to do this next thing that we see in verse 45. Why do we, why do we love our enemies, right? Why do we love our enemies? That's a big question. Why do we love? Here in verse 45, Jesus answers that. So that you may be children of your father in heaven. In other words, it makes sense. Like if you're adopted into the family of God because you said yes to Jesus Christ, that you should resemble him. Um, as I look out into even this sanctuary right here and you look at families sitting together, uh, there, there are resemblances, right? You can tell that you belong to one another. Uh, I know like with my family, a lot of us have small pointy ears and that's we're like little elves. Um, I know. And, and, and so people, oh, you got the ear, you know, are you a rich? Yeah, I'm a rich, you know, that's, that's who I am. Uh, like there should be resemblances of, of our creator, of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should, as, as we're in the sanctification process, I know it's a big word, that just means I'm becoming more like Jesus every day as God and I partner together to walk in his ways. As, as he is chipping away at me and, and I'm revealing more and more of who he is in my life, uh, we, we should resemble him, and especially how we interact with the toughest relationships on the planet. Those that are the hardest, the ones that seem to be the most unlovable, we are called to love. We are modeling the father. So big question, how does our heavenly father then treat those who hate him? So if we're to resemble our father, how, how does our heavenly father treat those who hate him? Him. Here's what Jesus says in the middle of verse 45. Don't miss this now. For he, meaning God, causes his son, that's S-U-N, okay, the son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So in other words, out of the character of God and his goodness, he blesses those who are not only believers who are adopted into his family, but also unbelievers, 
causes the rain or the sun to shine on the on the righteous and the unrighteous. What what this is known as in theology is is common grace. What is common to man, God in His goodness will bless you. All right. Now that doesn't mean that all will be saved. Not all will turn to Christ, but that does not stop God from loving people. Here are some examples of common grace in the scripture. Um, let's go to the, the Psalms here on the screen. Right there. Psalm 145, verse nine, the Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. What about the book of Romans? Romans chapter two, verse four. Now this is key. Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? So when God throws down some common grace on your, on your life, and you see, even if you're far from God, or even if you hate God, even if you got drug here to this sanctuary today by someone else, and you're like, I don't even know why I'm here, it's God's kindness. God is showing you kindness right here, right now. And his intent is to lead you to repentance, to turn from your ways and to turn to him because he knows what's best. He created you. Uh, the Bible is very clear. You were created by God and you were created for God. And until you recognize that, life will never make any sense. You will not understand the purpose of life. But you were created by God and for God. We were, we were created to glorify God with our lives and to enjoy him forever. And there's no greater joy than being in Christ. I said, there's no greater joy than being in Christ. Amen. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? I knew what I was before Christ. and I know what I am in Christ. And it's a lot different. It's, it's way different. Nothing can satisfy like being in the presence of Jesus Christ and walking with him daily. And so if you want to live the kind of ordinary love and not, the, and not beyond that, this is what he describes in verses 46 through 47. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. You know, those who were despised in, in that culture at that time who often cheated people. He's like, you're gonna be the same as them. Verse 47, if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. This is a description of unbelievers. So it's like, there, there should be a difference between unbelievers and believers in the way that you love. Because if you just love those who love you, that's easy. But if you wanna be like Christ, and you want to represent Christ and be an ambassador for Christ, we're to love those who are unlovable, love those who even despise us or maybe even hate us. And this is, this is a high standard. This is a great, this is a, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's a, we, we live at a greater standard. And so what is that great standard? Jesus is about to drop it like it's hot in verse 48. Look at this. <laughs> be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Ooh, that's tough. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. That word perfect, we often describe it as being a mature, complete kind of love, which is true, okay? But understand this, God's standard does not change just because we mess things up. God has a perfect standard. And he is saying right here, and sometimes we want to we want to mess with this verse and kind of make it come down to where our level is, but understand God's standard remains: be perfect. All right, and what he's meaning by that is that you you're called to love perfectly. All right, so this is a problem, right? There's a big gap between <laughs> how I love and what God calls me to love as a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're off the hook right now. Okay, big gap. I can't love perfectly. You can't love per per perfectly. So where, how do we do this? Where, where do we find this perfection? Ah, you, you know where I'm going with this. We find that perfection in Christ. Y'all, this is the gospel. God coming in human flesh. Why do we celebrate Christmas time? God coming in human flesh born of a virgin named Mary. Jesus, 
who has always existed as God, fully God, fully human, walks this earth and lives out the perfect commands and demands of God the Father. He did what none of us could do. He lived the sinless life, complete obedience. The only one qualified to pay the penalty for your sins and mine. And so he went to the cross so that we would not have to go to the cross. He paid our sins so we wouldn't have to pay for it as long as we trust in him and his goodness. Your goodness ain't gonna get you very far. I'm just here to tell you. It doesn't matter how many good deeds you do, you do, the Bible describes our best deeds as like filthy rags. Your goodness alone will not get you into heaven. You cannot do enough good deeds to kind of, to kind of sway the balance at the end and slide right into heaven in the last second. It's not gonna happen. You need a goodness, a righteousness, a perfection that you don't have. And that's why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. Second time, he's gonna come back to judge, but this time, he came to seek and to save how much was lost. And so Jesus, he, he, without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there is no forgiveness of sins. So Jesus sheds his blood on that cross to take care of every single sin you've ever committed, are committing, and will ever commit. He took it, bore the wrath of God the Father for you and for me. It's the great exchange. And not only that, as we know, he, he didn't remain in the grave. That's why we celebrate Easter. He, he rose again that third day. And what he did is he defeated death, he defeated the enemy, and he defe defeated the power of sin in your life. He has fully equipped you as he's giving you the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit within you, to be able to live a godly life in the ways that he has called us to live. So not only do we get the forgiveness of sins, but we also get the righteousness of Christ. We get, we get his perfection. So now when God the Father looks upon me, he doesn't just see a filthy sinner, he sees Christ in me. The only goodness I have is Christ in me. The only goodness I have is Christ in me. And now I'm made right with God the Father. Sinner can now have relationship with a sinless God. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And so because of the perfection of Christ, it impacts my relationships. I would put it in this way. Only the perfection of Jesus can perfect my love for others. Let me, let me describe it in this way, in basketball terms, because that's how I think sometimes. Uh, I'm 40 years old, just turned 40 back in November. I'm six foot tall. I can no longer dunk a basketball, all right? I could barely dunk it to begin with. But now I can no longer, I've got no hops. I've got no hops left. They are done. My legs, they, get, they, they won't. In my mind, I think, but legs, no. I cannot dunk a basketball unless someone hands me a trampoline. If somebody hands me a trampoline, you better believe it, I'm dunking on y'all. Why? Because I can go beyond my ability. This, this is the grace of God in our life. This is the perfection of Christ in us. On your own and in your own ability, you're not going to be able to love people well. Forget it. Like if I, if I just try hard enough, you know, just to love them, then, you know, forget it. It's not going to work. I, I need a supernatural kind of love. I need an uncommon kind of love. I, I need the perfection of Christ. And the perfection of Christ is going to perfect my love for others. I'm, I'm going to be able to love others in a way that Christ calls us to. Uh, just just as, a, as a reference here, 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. This is so good. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. All right? God was the initiator. You didn't just come to Christ on your own. He draws you to himself through his love. It's beautiful. And sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if we loved, if, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love, don't miss this, is made complete in us. God's, made, God's love is made complete in us. You and I, if you are a follower of Christ, are fully equipped to be able to love people better than you used to. And it's ongoing and it's maturing and it's being perfected, but it's because of the perfection of Christ in us. God giving you the grace to be able to love people well. So real life example of this, let's go back to our story 
of Keith Blackburn and Misty Wallace. 18 years after that shooting, Misty finds and searches for Keith on Facebook and messages him on there, I want us to meet up. So they meet up. All right, come on, revenge, retaliation. Here we come, right? Here we come. Just give it to them. You've been waiting your turn. It's been long enough. Come on, Misty, come on. And what does she do? She offers forgiveness. God had been working on her heart and she offers him forgiveness. Little knowing that God has also been working on Keith. Before his sentence was done in those eight years and eight months, his bunkmate had shared the good news of Jesus with him and he came to know Christ. And he got baptized within the walls of that prison. And when he got out of prison, guess what he did? He sought to get a seminary degree from Indiana Wesleyan University. And he went to serve back at the prison where he used to be an inmate, but now as a chaplain. And so when they met up, God was doing a supernatural work. Here's a picture of them together. And now they go and they share their story with others, testifying to the grace and the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. And if you didn't believe in God, I hope you believe in God now because only God could do something like that. So let me just share this with you. You, you may never get shot in the face with a gun. I hope that never happens to any of y'all, <laughs> all right? But you will eventually get shot at by others with words, actions, and attitudes. How will you respond? How will you respond? Follower of Jesus, how will you respond? Two quick things as we wrap up, just straight out of the scripture. Jesus says to pray and to love your enemies. Pray for your enemies, love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Pray for them every day if you have to, moment by moment if you have to, until your heart aligns with the heart of God and you see them the way that God sees them because they too are in need of God's grace. They too are sinners in need of a savior, just like you were as well. Don't ever forget the gospel, the good news of Jesus and how that has impacted your life. You were a messed up folk too. I was jacked up as well. But guess what? There's other people that need him and they're desperately seeking hope in this world. They, the hope is in Christ. Pray for them. And then also I would encourage you as you are seeking to love people, memorize scripture that speaks to what love is. You know, the, the scripture I mentioned earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses four through eight. Memorize that. I challenge you, memorize it. I, I know this about the Holy Spirit, that he is so faithful and bringing to mind scripture that you have read, memorized, or meditated on at the right moment. So that when you're dealing with somebody tough and difficult and your first reaction is out of the flesh, that we could take a holy pause and say, Lord, okay, I'm reminded love is patient, love is kind. Help me right now. Give me the grace to be able to love this person well who is right in front of me. And he will give you the ability to do that. On your own, you'll make a mess, but in Christ, you can lead somebody and point somebody to the goodness of our God. Uncommon love requires an uncommon heart. So let me ask you this, how is your heart this morning? Is there more work to be done? I know there's more work to be done in my own heart. I'm preaching this message to myself too. Okay, so let's go into a time of prayer and, and invite God to work on our hearts. Heavenly Father, um, we are so, so grateful, Lord, for your word, for your grace in our life, and how we don't deserve, Lord, to have a relationship with you, but you made a way, and that way was through your son, Jesus. So Lord, I pray for all the people represented in this room and online, wherever they are at in their relationship with you, there's more work to be done in us, but we can't do it. Lord, we need your grace. So maybe we'll be reminded of that and just keep coming back to you. Keep coming back to you. Lord, help me. Lord, mold me, shape me, make me like you. 
so so I may reflect your goodness in this life and that others may also experience the joy of, of walking with you on a daily basis and the joy of knowing that we have hope that when we breathe our last breath, we'll breathe our first, first breath in heaven with you. And so, uh, Lord, we love you. It's all because of you and all praise belongs to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. goodness. Come on, give God some praise in here. Hallelujah. Well, listen, um, I am just so grateful for my brother and my friend, Brandon, bringing this powerful message to us. And so we like to send you away every Sunday with at least two thoughts. 
I want a takeaway for you to put into action and then a celebratory moment. The takeaway is just simply this. First of all, we get nothing done in terms of loving our enemies without prayer. So think of who that enemy is to you and begin to pray for them. And then the second thing is don't just pray, but seek the word of God to help you love your enemy as you love God and yourself. And then lastly, in ter- well, let me just say, in terms of doing that, go back and listen to Brandon's powerful message. And then you recall Pastor Eric preached a couple of weeks ago about reconciliation. Go back and listen to that as well and let the word of God direct you. And then lastly, you can't just hear the word and not act on it. And so whoever that person is to you that you need to love, set an appointment with them, go to dinner, breakfast, lunch, or coffee, or something, and then make it right with them. Uh, That's what we want you to do. Lastly, listen, we are a generous, loving congregation. We show that love and that generosity during Thanksgiving, and you'll see on the screen here in just a couple of minutes, just a, a thank you from... Remember back at Thanksgiving, we we fed a bunch of families. These are the kids of those families that are just thanking you for being so generous to them. And so on behalf of our church, I want to extend that thank you to you as well. And let that be the heart that you direct yourself with. Let the heart be in you that says, hey, listen, God, I thank you for showing me grace. Now I can extend grace to others just like we did back at Thanksgiving. And with that, I'll say to you, put it into action and have yourselves a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.